Megalithic Star Maps with Martin Green. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, and we are coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science, where we are nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau. Not not so dusty today. It's, they're getting covered in ice. A yes, thin layer of water ice. dust. Yes, <laughs> dust of water. <laughs> So yeah, it's nice and cold outside. We got the the, the fires burning uh, here in Texas, and uh, a new episode in uh, in studio here. We are with Martin Green. So Martin has been in our Discord for you've been in there for a couple of years now, at least, Martin. Um, since about 2020, the in in fact since the lockdown, really. Oh, okay, yeah. So four years he's been in the Discord. Uh, his name in there is Megalithic Martin. And uh, he obviously is here to discuss megaliths, and uh, I'm really excited about this. Thanks for coming on the show, Martin. Yeah, welcome. Okay. It's, it's <laughs> a pleasure, actually. I'd like to thank you for having me, because um, the stuff I'm going to go through, I'm pretty committed to uh, it's pretty much all of it's new. Yeah. Uh, you, you, I mean, people in the Discord will have read a bit about it, but no one else will know anything about it. So it's sort of, I shan't say I've discovered it. I've been given it, really. You've been given it? <laughs> so, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's um, interesting. But I think that the basic part of it, uh, which is the star map in Yorkshire, the odds against it not being a star map, are so phenomenal that it must be. It must so be. So I, re- I want to get it out there that, you know, there is something there that is worth investigation. Now, what do you awesome. what what do you mean by star map? Like, it, you mean that it corresponds exactly to stars in the sky? That like, yep. a, like it's a drawing, yep. basically, of the night sky on the ground? Dr- it, well, yeah, but it's not all the stars in the night sky. Right, yeah, okay. <laughs> not all of them. There's just a few. Okay. <laughs> What they didn't do them all? Come on, <laughs> cheap map. <laughs> so you, so you, uh, what, what led you to discovering this? Like, how did this okay. come about? I mean, I, as as you can see by looking at me, I'm an old man by now, so. <laughs> and I've been through uh, a lot of um, changes in my life. Uh, started off as an engineer, actually, two room engineer. So. When Chris Dunn talks about um, accuracy of stuff or um, the super work that um, his son and their team are doing on the uh, on the vases, I totally get all that stuff. Uh, and the, pe- the people who say they can do it by hand just really annoy me. <laughs> they obviously yep. know nothing about engineering. <laughs> Um, so I did that for oh, seven or eight years. And then uh, at the same time, I was quite interested in, at, at the time, there was Velikovsky around yeah. and uh, uh, people like that. And there was the guy who did Stonehenge Decoded or something. I can't remember the name of the book, but that really fascinated me. But then I went to university and I had all this sort of fringe stuff knocked out. <laughs> so I became I became the arch skirp, you know. <laughs> anything anything that was sort of edgy and off to the side, I just wasn't interested in. Uh. Uh, but then, of course, we got to oh, probably the late 80s and the dinosaur killer asteroid. Yeah. And you sort of began to think, well, maybe some of these theories might hold a bit of water. And then somewhere around about 2012, I stumbled across the Younger Dryas thing. And I avoided it for ages. You know, it's fringe stuff is this. I don't I don't want to be involved in it. But eventually, <laughs> eventually I looked it up. And uh, I think the, probably the... The first thing that I really found was Randall. 
Okay. So went through the Randall stuff, uh, and then I, um, you know, you you have the logical path from there, and it's uh, so I got to you from there, and um, listened to a zillion of the uh, of the podcast. Where a zillion <laughs> at that point, but you know, it's... <laughs> um, and eventually I, uh, I well. I joined the Discord, uh, but all the people in the Discord seem so knowledgeable and, uh, you know, know absolutely so much. And you just thought, well, what, what can I offer in this sort of uh, group of people? I mean, there are people like Tony and Janus and Ash and uh, yeah, um, Shannon and, you know, uh, you know, I mean, all this goes on forever. Um, so... I've got to say, I think that if I hadn't have joined the Discord, I'd still be on the skirt side of things, you know, I'd still be mm. standard model is right and all the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, the old Snake Bros Discord corrupted <laughs> you, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Good on him. Wait a second. You listened to hundreds of episodes of our show, and that didn't change you from being a skirt, but you joined the Discord. <laughs> Tony? <laughs> anyway, after about a year, I decided to do the test. Oh, the yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. so you were so you... a member for about a year before. Yeah. I did the... <laughs> nice. Okay, so you were you uh you were lurking for a while. Nice. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So any anyone who uh, hasn't done the quiz and is listening to this, I'd recommend you do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you've been you've been a you know like a like a staple or a pillar of the community since you joined. I mean, it's, you've become you've become one of the admins, well, and uh, yeah, you're you're posting all the time, like uh, full of you know stuff, full of data, and it's very yeah, thoughtful yeah. and it's great. Yeah, there's days when I think I ought to be doing something else, digging the garden. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you have been, so, you've been posting your, you know, some things about your research into the 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 megaliths of the UK, the Yorkshire alignments, and everything in the Discord. But you've basically put together a, a complete presentation on this work, right? Yeah. Yeah, so shall I share the screen and we'll uh, yeah. have a look at it? Yep. Yeah. And Oops. this Discord sounds work? like a great place. Yeah, you should check I it should out. Go there. <laughs> yeah, you should join. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see that? Yes, yes, sir. Star map in Yorkshire. The hunter, the bird, right. and the seven okay. sisters. Okay, so um anyone who knows the stars will probably recognize the the hunt of the bull and the seven sisters uh but we've also got lots of stuff about the devil and later on we've got some stuff about saint michael and the devil but not for this episode all right hmm. um page down ain't working I'm having a problem, guys. Uh, just uh, you might click click on the actual. Um, uh, ah, there we go. Yeah, right. PowerPoint okay. screen. Then you can change it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the main aim of this today is uh, to convince any of you guys that are listening to this or watching it that there is a genuine star map in Yorkshire. Um. If I can convince you of that, I'll have done a good job. All right. Uh, so we start off by looking at Yorkshire monuments, uh, not in any real detail, but I'll show you some of them because they're nice to look at, really. <laughs> uh, we'll we'll have some star law, uh, particularly around the Pleiades and uh, uh, Orion. Um, we then have a bit of an extension to Robert Bavall's work All right. on the Orion um, correlation. Um, I believe that there are some synchronicities between Egypt and Yorkshire, so a, a quick look at those. Uh, I also want to mention the conventional dating of the site. The conventional dating is not very far out, actually. 
Um, I can give you what I think is the exact year that it was designed, but I don't want to give it in this episode. Oh, stay um, tuned, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to talk about uh, the people who built it. Uh, because it's a bit of a mystery, really, because they actually were there for, I don't know, about 2,000 years, but were totally replaced just about Mm -hmm. um, after they'd built these monuments, obviously. So before we get too far into this, I'd just like to say thanks to you guys and thanks to everyone in the uh, Discord, because... I would never have done all of this stuff uh, without the sort of discipline of being there and uh, discussing it with people and that sort of thing. And the certain, I mean, encouragement from certain people as well. So That's awesome. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> this guy. <laughs> you hear that, yeah. folks? He calls being in the Discord a discipline. It is. <laughs> <laughs> well, once you've started posting on something, it's difficult to stop, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you're right. It is. And then and then if the if the quality of the responses and the engagement you get is high, then it encourages you to increase the quality of your, your own stuff, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'd particularly like to say thank you to uh, Shannon, which I'm girl in the um, Discord. Yeah, Shannon's fantastic. Because uh, she started me off on this particular path. Uh, and I'll mention it on the next slide. Um, she lives in Yorkshire. She went there, I think, from Los Angeles. Well, quite why you'd go to Wakefield from Los Angeles, I don't understand. But they, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And she has done an episode, um, I think it was episode 209, on Yorkshire folklore. So if anyone wants an introduction to Yorkshire folklore, that's a good place to start. Yeah, that was a fun episode. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also to Ash and uh, the lamented Janus, who, um, whatever we say about him, he was quite encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> on, this, on this particular project. Oh, that's good. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Knew everything, but would never tell you anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect a description. <laughs> uh, and I'd also like to thank Pete Cheeseborough more recent from more recent times because I've had all this stuff sitting around. You know, I, I save all my posts just so that I can refer back to them if I need to. Uh, but I'd had it all sitting around and uh, never done anything with it. And he encouraged me to put it in some sort of logical sequence. And, and what you're seeing is this. Wait, you now, you actually save your Discord posts in a separate? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Organized. That's organized. <laughs> well, I don't save them all. I mean, there's loads of them I do, but certainly everything on this subject. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Smart. I also did. I also did something on um, uh, maps of the Sea Kings, if you remember, and yeah. I saved up those because uh, I thought they were quite interesting. And really, it was a book summary. So, yeah. Well, Mark, we might have to have you back on to do read, that. I yeah. just read the book. And yeah, <laughs> <laughs> told people about it. Um, Pete might be worth having on this show at some point if you if you're interested. He's involved in a couple of other channels, uh, Matter of Britain and Britain's Hidden History, and he's done some work on very early mining, tin mining, and uh, general mining, I guess, on uh, uh, on Dartmoor, which is quite interesting because, according to the standard model. There was never any mining before the Romans. Mm. In fact, there was never anything in Britain before the Romans. Right. <laughs> and we're just about to disprove that. Oh, no. Um, and he's also done a fair bit of stuff on, um, well, Britain's hidden history tells you, actually. I mean, it's the history of Britain without the Anglo-Saxons. So it's the, the ancient Britons or the, uh, who became the Welsh. So, he, you know, you might be interested in having him on. Yeah. So this stuff on the left, then, 
is what we're going to cover. And these are in later episodes. All right. Uh, yeah, we're def uh, I'm definitely interested in ancient, you know, ancient mining for sure. So, yeah. Yeah. So it'd be worth a chat with anyway. All right. That's uh, you'll see, by the way, that the background to this is a star map. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So the play Orion and Taurus. Here, Orion down here and Taurus up here. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So all this started one night after a couple of whiskeys <laughs> when I was posting on the, uh, on the Discord. <laughs> Uh, and I got into a chat with Shannon, and we were talking about what we knew about Yorkshire. Uh, and obviously, Ilkley Moor is the place to start, really. I mean, you've all probably heard of the song, whereas they've been since I saw thee on Ilkley Moor by Tat. <laughs> mm. Can't say I've heard of it. Obviously, you haven't heard of the song. <laughs> no. <Tat>. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Ilkley Moor is um, a ridge between the Wolfdale Valley and the Airedale Valley, and it stands sort of high in the air and in great views on every side. So the ancients actually used it for quite a lot of stuff. So there are some examples here. So a nice little stone circle here, and you can see the views in the background there. What are the uh, what are the sizes of those stones like uh, compared to a person? Uh, they're like, quite small. I've yeah. got a theory about stone sizes actually, because stone circles probably started about three thousand BC in Britain, um, and the Neolithic people who built them vanished around about two thousand four hundred, two thousand three hundred. We'll see that later on. Um, but they were replaced by the Beaker people, and it seems as though all the smaller stone circles are a Beaker people uh, production. Mm. So the Beaker people were the first uh, uh, Bronze Age people, but they certainly didn't have the same vis architectural vision as the people that went before them. Interesting. So... They're small, but they're quite nice. Uh, there's also rock art up there. This is the most famous one called the Swastika Stone. Um, and later on, I've got some theories about what this might be as well. All right. Uh, and a bit more rock art. And you'll see that these are sort of interesting because they're sort of the coal cup and ring stones, but you can see the cups are these cutouts here, and they seem to be joined by these lines. Yeah. Um, so that I guess that there must be some sort of logic in yeah. why that design has been adopted. You know, you don't you don't sit down with a, a stone chisel and a stone hammer and make that without any reason. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. I can um, now that you pointed out, I can see how that might be. Uh... Yeah, let's just go back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's I just can... telling you yeah. which which terminal is positive and which terminal is negative. <laughs> yes, that's right. It does look like a circuit diagram. It does. <laughs> <laughs> and I always think that this looks as though it could be. Uh, you've heard of these comets that sort of like Catherine wheels. Yes. Yeah. 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 Could be something okay. like that. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So we then went on to other things we knew, and um, I'd known this, this, this. I don't know whether you can see the top because I've got the menu in the way. Uh, no, it's called the it. Devil's Arrow. Yes. It's, um, it's a stone row, three stones in a row. Uh, and the this is the smaller one. Uh, and these two are the second and third biggest in England. So they the, just about see that one that's in the tree line over there. Uh, so they're just outside uh, a, a rather nice little market town called Borough Bridge in North Yorkshire, 
uh, it's worth worth going just to have a look at the town actually. Um, and I knew it from in my teens because you could see it from the A1, which you maybe know as the uh, Great North Road. Uh, but when the road was widened, uh, they sort of built embankments and things. You can't see it anymore. Uh. Uh, so uh, two largest stones are the second and third in Britain. They all have cut marks around the bottom. And this picture doesn't show them very well, actually, but so uh, they do. Uh, and this it's supposed to be in the greatest single stone row anywhere in Britain. Is there any evidence that there were more than three in the past? Uh, come on to that. Okay. All right. <laughs> so He's telling me we'll get to that. One... You hear that? He just pulled a Marty on me right there. <laughs> I guess all Martins do this. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We, we, have, we have training. <laughs> so this is the one in the woods, and this is the tallest one, and really the picture doesn't give you an impression of the size. I mean, uh, but it is big. Uh, and you can see that there are some markings on it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to try and do some scanning on it, but my oh, phone is useless and I can't. So <laughs> I'll just have to live with that. Looks but, like we need to get you a new phone. Yeah, but you have been, you, <laughs> but you have gone to visit them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah okay. Uh, these three pictures. Sorry, let's just go back. These three wow. pictures are my pictures. That one I've pulled off the internet. Okay. Man, look at this. Um, this is the only one I've found that really gives you an impression of the size. So yeah, obviously, a very old picture, and this is the. This stone here is the same as this one here. So it's now, a small one. The field has been well ploughed and there's a lot of earth built up around the bottom of it. So do you it know what looks the, small. Now. Do you know what the soil profile is like? I mean, I I asked that because I wonder how deep these things are set. Uh, they're supposed to be. The tail is, and I don't know whether it's true or not, but the tail is they're as deep in the, in the ground as they are yeah. above. Yeah. Now, wow. I can't believe that, but well, you could imagine that maybe a third of them is in the ground. Well, if it was clay and yes, fairly deep, clay. if it was deep clay, um, you would have to put about that much in the ground to keep it standing straight for yeah, thousands yeah. of years. Otherwise, it yeah. would just fall over it. It is clay because this is the bottom of uh, an ancient glacial lake. And in mm. fact, it's the same glacial lake as I'm speaking to you from the bottom of. Ah. Oh. Uh, and I'm... From deep beneath the glacial lakes. Yeah. Yeah, cool. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm 70 miles away. And my wife gets really annoyed about this clay because you can dig down in the garden for about six inches and you're in solid clay that you just can't, can't move. move. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can't move yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. So this one on the right bottom is leaning. So it's like, yeah. you know, the engineers were like, it only needs to go this far and, and it'll be straight. And, they, and the builders were like, bro, yeah. we don't have to put it down that deep. <laughs> and now it's leaning. <laughs> Now, you'll see that the housing is slowly beginning to encroach on the area, which yeah. is just sad, really, isn't it? I mean, it's... <laughs> right, how many stones? So, if you look back in history, a guy called Peter Frank came in 1694, he said he saw seven of them. Mm. And seven is quite significant, actually, so just hold on to that number. Uh, somebody else said five with certainly know there were four. One of them was taken out and used in one of the local bridges. Ah. So, uh... Engineers again. Build a bridge out of it! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, seven, seven is the maximum claimed. Some old pictures, but you can see that the surroundings have changed repeatedly over time. <laughs> Yeah. Ah, oh, that that picture on the lower left, how that it makes them look like obelisks. That's cool. Yeah, it wow. does, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's probably drawn by somebody who'd been to Egypt. <laughs> but how, I mean, you how... like like if they were incredibly ancient and they're made of like the local limestone, you could imagine uh, it's grit. It's grit stone, actually. Oh, okay. Okay. What is it? Mm -hmm. Grit stone? Is that what you said? It's a sort of sandstone. Like a sandstone. Right? sandstone. Yeah. It's yeah. a very damn dense sandstone that's full of quartz crystals. But that that uh, weathering on the top, yeah. the striations, it's, it, yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome. So, 
how old is the name Devil's Arrows? Uh, can we talk about that at some later point? Yes, we may. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, we're going to get this with Martin. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's yeah, fine. yeah, no, it's, it's totally fine. Uh, the I've had a discussion with a couple of people in the Discord about these uh, these grooves, mm -hmm. uh, and none of us really know whether it's erosion or the purposeful. Yeah. Um, but there are many stones that do have them. Do you, uh, see it? do you see it in the natural, wherever these stones came from, in the natural bedrock where that sandstone is, do you see similar erosion? Yeah, but it's horizontal. Ah, so. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Having said that, these were probably horizontal originally, yes, so yeah. it, it might be natural. Uh, I don't make much of it. Well, I don't make anything of it in this, actually. So. Okay. But we did have a discussion about it. We then went on to a place I didn't know about and should really. I mean, Thornborough Henges. So uh, these are three very large henges at West Tanfield, which is near Ripon. And once again, just hang on to Ripon because Ripon is the smallest city in Britain. Uh, and it has a very impressive cathedral. Now that you've yeah. pointed out the the cut marks and stuff, I can see how the hinges might be the same thing, but yeah. very large. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. So these are pictures from when I went there. To give you an idea of the size, that's my car, which you might just about be able to see. Oh, yeah. And I'm, Way out there, stood, right? I'm stood at this point here. Wow. So gives you an idea how big they are. Wow. They're not the biggest hinges in Britain. Um got a picture of the biggest. Uh this so the northern one is covered in trees, uh, and probably is the best preserved. So you can see the uh, embankment here. Yeah. And then there's a ditch which you can't see very well here and a raised bit here. So this is an um, actual this is an earthwork. Is that correct? I mean, it, it's yes. It's, it so, looks what, so, what is what is a henge? Yeah, here we go. So ah. Most people, <laughs> most people think that this is a henge, right? It's I not. Thought it's, that a was a henge. it's a stone circle, and it's a very blingy stone Bl circle. <laughs> blingy, nice. <laughs> this is what a henge is. So, it's an embankment with generally two entrances, and you can see here that there's got two entrances, uh, a ditch inside there and a raised centre. And they originally thought that there might be uh, fortified, but you wouldn't put the ditch inside was the logic. Even the archaeologists reached that conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a genuine um, henge and what it looks like. Okay. So ah. this is a proper view of stone henge. Right. The henge is the the embankment in the ditch around way That's around. right. Yeah. 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 Uh, so at Thornborough, the embankment is well, was thought to be about 14 foot high. I didn't mention that, actually. Let me just go back. So this embankment here is currently about 12 foot high so it's about wow. twice as high as i am huh. so thought to be about 14 foot high and 65 feet wide uh, and the ditch is still 2.6 meters deep which is about nine feet i guess to you americans <laughs> give it to us in bananas <laughs> <laughs> Now, some, some other stone henges. So stone henge, the only stone henge. So there's Avebury and Gladstonebury as well. Uh, the Devil's Quite in Oxford, and we'll come back to this in a later uh, session. What is quite? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, what is a quite? What does a quite mean? A quite is a thing that you throw in a game. Oh, okay. Like, now, a, like a frisbee? Like a frisbee, okay. yeah. So if you think about that uh, game that the French play where they throw 
metal balls and it's you've got to get it near the target ball. Yes. And it's similar to that. Like bowling. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And as Pete mentioned, it it's quite interesting that you've got a devil's coin. So it implies the devil is throwing something. Yeah. And you'll see why that's it. You'll okay. see why that's interesting later. So Somebody at some point surveyed it and I pinched it from the internet. All the numbers around, um, interesting round numbers there. And I'll go and I'll mention why in a minute. But um, the roundness of the numbers implies one of two things either that the erosion is that bad that it's difficult to measure. Yeah. Uh, and there is some truth in that. But also, there might be underlying here some sort of standard unit of measure. Uh. So you'll notice that we have a diameter of 860 feet. Well, the cell diameter is 864,000 miles. Uh, this is 2,480 feet. Earth, Earth solar circumference is uh, 24,860 miles. Mm. Now, that might be pure coincidence. And a lot of what we see today might be coincidence. Uh, you've just got to pick between it and decide for yourself whether you think these things are relevant or not. I'm not sure those are, but there you go. As the, as the saying <laughs> right, goes, coincidence takes planning. <laughs> yes. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, there's no such thing as coincidence. Yeah. Right. Some archaeologists believe that the uh, layout of these henges represent Orion's belt. And this is how I got onto this, um, as you'll see as we go on. And there was even a BBC programme about it. So if anyone wants to watch it, uh, just let me know and I'll send them that link. All right. <clears throat> you'll see here that that it shows a picture of them and it says looking southwest at the midwinter sunset. Well, mm -hmm. that's a load of bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, the midwinter sunset. You can't tell because uh, Stellarium screws up the dates in the past and you've got to run uh, a plug in to get the right date. Huh. Uh, but this is the midwinter sunset. And you'll see here that you've got Orion's belt over here, certainly not standing over the hinges. So this is viewed from Thornborough. Mm. So sun setting there, Orion rising there. Okay. So this is wrong. <laughs> but the Orion, uh, the layout is right. So. As I said before, I was chatting to Shannon about this for quite a long time, actually. We went through all sorts of stuff. So there's some natural things we discussed and all sorts of things. <clears throat> and eventually I went to bed and uh, I was sort of wound up about this Orion's belt thing. And I couldn't sleep to begin with. And I woke up in the middle of the night. And I get this thing called my three o'clock voices, which um, uh, were so named by, I used to be a project manager in IT, and I come in one uh, occasionally I, uh, and say, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning thinking this, and one of the guys eventually turned around and said, it's your bloody three o'clock voices again. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. But I woke up thinking about it, and I thought, well, I've got three hinges, but further to the south of them, I've got three stones. Do the three stones represent anything? Uh, and I thought, shall I get out of bed and have a look? <laughs> and I thought, no, nah, no, nah, I prefer being in bed. <laughs> it's a good job I didn't, actually, because just looking, you know, it's difficult to tell, and uh, I'll cover that in a minute. Um, but the 3 a.m. voices are relatively interesting, I think, because I don't know whether it's, and uh, I don't think anyone else does, but, I mean, you hear tales of 
uh, people getting book ideas you know writing a book from what what they get in that sort of time of the morning or writing music and not everyone has this and some people do <laughs> so is it something more than that i don't know just worth thinking about that yeah so well, sh shall we any... shall we take a break and then come back and talk about yeah, what yeah, the... Yeah, okay, because the... we're beginning to get into the body of it. All right. So. Fantastic. This is awesome, man. I yeah. love it. This is great. We are back, ladies and gentlemen, Brothers of the Serpent podcast, joined by Martin, or Megalithic Martin in Megalithic the Discord. Martin. And this is fascinating stuff. I love the presentation already. Uh, I love where it's going. I don't even know where it's going, but it, I know it's going somewhere <laughs> we'll, great. we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that later. <laughs> Please, sir. Yeah, continue. continue. Okay, so... Just, just a reminder, um, we looked at those three hinges that the archaeologists thought might be Orion's belt, or a lot of them think are Orion's belt. Then I went to bed and had my three o'clock voices saying, are there any other stars that might reflect, or might be reflected by the Devil's Arrow stones? Uh, now, in those days, I knew absolutely nothing about the stars. Obviously, I everyone, I think, knows about Orion's Belt, the three most obvious stars in the sky. Uh, but other than that, I didn't really know anything. So what to do? Well, I didn't have Stellarium or anything of that nature. Uh, so the best I could do was Google star groups. And I managed to find, this isn't the picture I found, actually, because I can't find that anymore. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is a picture of that part of the sky. And you can see down here, we've got Orion's belt, and that's the sword. Uh, Beetlejuice up there, right down there. Um, and just looking at it, it's pretty obvious that there's something going on down here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes, sir. Now, interestingly... If we can draw a straight line between those, so maybe there's some sort of connection, who knows? Mm -hmm. And we'll come to that. Also, there is another cluster here, but I didn't spot that at the time. So what we have is uh, Orion's Belt. This is the High Hades, and that's Aldebaran, uh, which is the High, high Hades is the... Um, <clears throat> Uh, is the face of the bull yes. in Taurus. And Aldebaran is the eye of the bull. Uh, and uh, this is the Pleiades. So could the devil's arrows be the Pleiades? Um, this isn't an actual picture of it, but you can see that I've put a picture together with the Pleiades up there and the devil's arrows yeah. down there. Uh, so I've got a picture of the stars. What I really need is a map, and finding a good map isn't easy. You can see, I mean, I've, this is obviously a very old map, just to give you an idea that it's not easy. <laughs> so, <laughs> how do you compare that to the ground? Sorry about that. Let's see if I can get rid of that. Uh, so I obviously need a map, and I also need the locations of the monuments as well. And they've got to be accurate locations. You just can't do it from anything else. Now, at the time, I didn't know anything about Google Earth either. So the best I could do with it was an Ordnance Survey map. And to those that aren't British, the Ordnance Survey was uh, a mapping organisation set up by the British government, I think, in the Napoleonic Wars. So the map of the whole country, I think it's the first country to be uh, to be completely mapped. Uh, and the maps are still used by 
people for loads of reasons, but I'm familiar with them because I did a lot of walking on the moors, uh, and they're very good for that sort of thing. But here you see that I've got the, the henges there, another couple of henges I found down here, and the devil's arrows down there. Hmm. And this is that map of the sky. Uh, Do they look the same? Uh, Roughly? It's It's close, yeah. Interesting. I could probably convince you that they're the same. So, but why would they want to reflect the Pleiades on the ground? Is there any significance about them? Well, this is uh, the best picture I've been able to find of how they look. Um, and you can see that it's really a hazy, juggly little group in the sky. And you can, if you've got good eyesight, and I do, because you can see by how I wear glasses, <laughs> uh, people say that you can see certainly six. Uh, some people claim to be able to see 14 or more. Uh, I just don't believe it. Looking at this, by the way, that's um, uh, the Pleiades. Here's the Hyades with Aldebaran. And uh, Orion is lost in the sunrise or sunset. I don't know which it is. Um, interestingly, if you look at the Jewish works in the Talmud, it says that there are about 100 stars in the Pleiades uh, star cluster. And my immediate response to that is, how on earth did they know that? How do they know that? Huh. Yeah. Uh, we currently think there's over a thousand. We don't know how many there are, but we wow. think there's over a thousand. Um, now, both the Pleiades and the Hyades are uh, tight star clusters that are gravitationally bound together. Uh, over time, they'll slowly begin to separate because the gravity of other things that are around them, pull them apart. Wow. Uh, now, you might think that this is a silly question, but can you measure the distance between them? I certainly can't. Uh, but if people want to put stones in the ground, they're going to have to. Yeah. Right. Is there any relevance to them? Well, Pleiades are also known as the Seven Sisters, and there are many, many legends of the Seven Sisters. Um, this is one of the most scientific things, but people have known this for thousands of years. So this is serious here, Orion, Hyades and Pleiades. Uh, first seven uh, odd numbers, sorry, first four odd numbers, um, and the first three prime numbers. So they've got some significance, and they're all in straight line. Hmm. Interestingly, Sirius is moving in, it has the biggest movement in the sky of any of the bright stars. Um, and it's moving in this direction. And it's only from about a um, thousand BC uh, that it it actually crossed this line. So this line, it would have been just above the line uh, going back, say, 5,000 years. And now if you look at it in the sky, it's just below the line. Huh. Depends, on, obviously, how, how you align that up. But <clears throat> I did a post one Christmas saying that the uh, uh, star of Bethlehem was actually uh, Sirius being lined up along that line. Hmm. <clears throat> there are lots of stories about um, Orion and uh, Taurus fighting. Um, this particular one is uh, Taurus is defending the uh, uh, the Pleiades from Orion because Orion is a randy old man. In other stories, it's the uh, the bull chasing uh, the Pleiades and Orion chasing the bull to try and protect them. Huh. So lots and lots of legends like that, and they go back forever. Hmm. As I said, they go back forever. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. This is 18,000 years old. It's in Lassar, in the <clears throat> caves, and you can see that that has to be the Pleiades. That oh has to be God. on the barn. 
Yeah. Now, there are people that say that this is Orion's belt. Four there stars. are four of them there. Yeah. Now, interestingly, if you look at Orion's belt, there is, um, what do they call it? One a cloud. Like a, yeah. There's, I can't remember what they're called. It's a, a, a gas cloud. A planetary nebula? A nebula. Um, yeah. Yes, yes, a nebula. Yeah. There is a nebula which sits right on the line. Uh, now, one wonders whether at some point in the past it was bright and therefore it looked as though there were four stars. Possible. Or, yeah, or it's the remnants of an exploded star. Like, that's how you get... Yes, yeah. That's how you get a nebula yeah. often. Yeah. I mean, we know about the Orion Nebula, which actually uh, it isn't that old, I don't think. Uh, which is somewhere down here. In fact, it says there, look. <laughs> oh, yeah, Ryan well, Nebula. Yeah. yeah, but there is another nebula in, in there, so maybe maybe it was bright, maybe it was an exploding star. Yeah. Maybe there were four stars, who knows. The Never Sky Disc, well, Never is a small town in Germany. This is Bronze Age uh, and was found there. So obviously that has some sort of, you know, the Pleiades had some sort of significance to them. Yeah. Uh, in uh, Mesopotamia, and there's a tale, tales that the Anukai came from there, which, well, if they did, they were only stopping off there because they're only about uh, 100 million years old, apparently. <laughs> so, so not enough time to uh, uh, to evolve. Now I can't see it here, but apparently this is this is from Harappa, uh, and this is Rai, and this is Taurus, and the Pleiades here. Hmm. I can't actually see that. And of course, there were stories. Um, there was a somebody wrote a paper about this. The oldest story ever in the world was claimed to be a story about the Pleiades uh, by native uh, Australians. It's 100,000 years old, Wow, was the claim. And the newest story, so this is from Prometheus. you probably recognise the picture. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. So it's an open star cluster. It's for. 444 light years away, formed in the last 100 million years, mainly hot blue luminous stars. Uh, and the reason it says here is they dance, is that because of the atmosphere, they, they do vibrate and mm. shimmer, and that's what makes it difficult to count them. <laughs> uh, I love your caption. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, They're sadly, young, hot, sadly, blue, it's not and they mine. like to dance. Yeah. <laughs> sadly, it's not mine. I okay. pinched it from the internet. <laughs> <laughs> now, in legend, uh, the uh, the Pleiades and the Hyades form what's called the Golden Gate of the uh, Ecliptic. The Ecliptic, of course, is the path that the star, uh, the moon, uh, the sun appears to take through the uh, the sky. And you'll see here, this this is from Stellarium, but this is the ecliptic, and here they are. So Golden any Golden of Golden the cool. any of the planets and the moon and the sun travel along this path, more or less. I mean the planets do wander off it about eight degrees ish. Uh, in the Meso Mesopotamian to pronounce, isn't it? Uh, Pantheon, they stood on the path of the moon. Well, they would do because we've just seen why. Yes. Uh, and a piece of trivia here, the distance to the Pleiades is used as a first step to current, uh, calibrate cosmic distances. Huh. So yeah, I was presumably... Gonna, can, I, I was going to ask... Can, go ahead. Hmm? Go ahead. Presumably. Yeah, presumably you can triangulate that distance. But, yeah. I was going to ask then, you when you when you mentioned before about measuring the distance between them. Do modern astronomers do that? Like, do they have estimates of the closeness of the stars in that cluster? 
you know, I've never looked at that. Hmm. Well, maybe we can check it during the break. Yeah, yeah. Now, that area of the sky there is interesting because you may remember that um, the British scientists, Clue and Napier, yes. had this theory about a big comet coming into the inner solar system somewhere between twenty and 30,000 years ago and then breaking up into lots of uh, smaller fragments and that maybe um, that people have added since, maybe uh, one of those fragments or a group of those fragments were what were hit in 11,900 BC or whenever it was. Right. Yeah, the start of the Younger Dryas. Well, the radiant point of uh, of the Torridge, the Orionids, the Persids, etc., etc., cetera, et cetera, et cetera <laughs> are actually very near the Pleiades and the Hyades. So I, I expect all of those, or certainly most of them, uh, come from that big comet. In Celtic mythology, they are associated with Samhain. It's an interesting word to pronounce as well. Yes. <laughs> Samhain. I, I went on, yeah, I went on the internet to find out how to pronounce it, and there are a number of videos on there of how to do it, and every one of them is different. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> uh, in Indian culture, the, the star of fire and their ruling deity is the fire god Agni. And in China, it's the hairy head of the white tiger of the West. Hmm. So they might be tied in, in legends and things with uh, comet strikes, or certainly comets in the sky. So still going along the path of what significance they had, they even appear in the uh, in the Bible. So can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades or loose the belt of Orion? Can you lead forth the Mazareth in their season? Or can you guide the bear with its children? Huh. The Mazareth is the zodiac, so those will be the 12 uh, um, constellations of the zodiac. And, of course, uh, each month we get a new constellation. So it's talking about, really, can you stop time? But, ah. you know, it gets into um, uh, just part of common culture going back a long, long way. Now, what is the bear with its children? Is that the great bear? Like the, the, oh, big the great bear, yeah. Or it's a major... And yeah. Now, interestingly, some legends point to um, events in the sky moving from the bear uh, and travelling in the direction of the Pleiades. Mm. So it's quite possible that um, a comet would have tracked that way. Mm. Ah. So maybe that's oh, the bear's children. In that case, it, it wouldn't be a toroid, of course. Right. Okay, let's go back to star mapping. So we've seen why there's some significance there. Uh, so I found these diagrams, uh, and you'll see that whoever did it has been nice and drawn lines through them. So you can see that the line to uh, from the Devil's Arrows to Thornborough, so this one here, goes directly through another hinge called Nunwick Henge. And it does go directly through it. <clears throat> but this one here, so we have the Devil's Arrows, and it goes up to Canabine Henge and then on to Hutton Moor Henge. And there's a tumulus there, which I've not marked. But it doesn't, it's not that accurate. And there is significance in why it's not accurate. These people were much better at making things accurate than this would actually indicate, mm. as we'll see as we go on. Now, the best I could do in uh, at that time in finding the location of places was a, a, a tourist brochure, which is this. <laughs> <laughs> show, 
showed these uh, the hinges and such like. But it did enable me to build this this map. So onto the star map. This is my first attempt. So I, I had the map I showed and I overlaid a cut out piece of card actually where I wow. marked on the stars. Uh, but that looks pretty good actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And it also looks as though there's something going on around here as well. So what can we do better? So I then discovered Stellarium. Um to those that don't know, it's uh, open source, so it's totally free. Uh, there are very few bugs in it, but dates are appalling. Um, <laughs> why? I wonder why you say that. Why are the dates <laughs> appalling? <laughs> well, not this particular stuff, but some of it you're really interested in uh, in specific dates, so particularly... Uh, um equinox or um uh, solstice dates or maybe major lunar um standstill dates uh and stellarium as the standard dating in it it uses uh the dates that would have been used at that time so you go back not very far and you're into julian dates and of course they're that gives you a shorter year, so the further you go back in time, uh, the further out it gets. Oh, no so, kidding. <clears throat> I did not know that. Because I, I, on, the thing that occurred to me was that that it, if it's accounting for precession and you're going back thousands of years, that the, you know, the degrees of, uh, like if you go back 2,000, or almost 3,000 years, you're going to be 30 degrees off of where the equinoxes or the solstices were. So the dates are going to be, you know, a whole month off. Um, <clears throat> but if that's it, not the it, case, if it's if it's doing something else, I don't know. It, it, it actually works them out quite well. And there are two bits of uh, plugins that... Uh, very good for sorting it. So you can get oh. a plugin called Archeo Lines, which gives you uh, the position from any point on Earth of where the solstice is and the major and minor lunar standstills are. Wow. Okay. And enable you to track any single object in the sky. So you can see the solstice lines. So it gives you a line uh, across the sky. Uh, and where it crosses the horizon. Um, and you can set the sun as well, so each day you can progress through until the line of the sun matches the solstice line, and then you're on the solstice. Oh, wow. I have to now get this plug in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if I'll send you a couple of screenshots of how awesome. to do it. Okay. Yeah, and the other one is there is a calendar plugin which gives you just about every calendar I've heard of and quite a few more, uh, and you can select the ones you want to show on the bottom of the screen. Mm. So whereas the main uh, date uh, date change uh, screen gives you what would be what we would consider as the wrong date, you can see on the bottom of the screen what the right date is. Mm. Wow. Oh, you should send this stuff to Kyle in the Discord. Force him to get in. <laughs> yeah, you you have really sold me on this Discord thing. I've, this is the most convincing story of the how awesome the Discord is. I think I've ever heard. Uh, uh, I'd heard um, Randall talking about Google Earth a lot, and I, you get quite a few people making vids on uh, YouTube using Google Earth as well. So in the end, I gave up and started to have a look at it, and <laughs> it really is excellent for this yeah. sort of work. <laughs> so you can measure distances, angles, you can see the profile of the land along a line, and you can also build a library of your own points. Yeah. So this is part of my library, isn't it? Uh, I mean, I've got hundreds of things in it now. 
statement. So, awesome. And you can also, as part of that, you can also have lines between objects. Uh, so, you know, I can draw a line between, say, Catrick Henge and the Devil's Arrows and save it and uh, wow. turn it on and off and just refer to it to get the distance and so on. So anyone that wants to do it, that's a good source. Um, you need to know where these sites are. So megalithic.co.uk is the best one I've found. It's got sites in America. It's got sites all around the world. I'm sure that the UK coverage is far better than anywhere else. Uh, and there's another couple down there that I've used. So Yeah, to get KLM files for pre-built, yeah. For collections, yeah. yes. Yeah. I have yeah. a I have a number of enormous collections in my Google Earth as well. It's really awesome. I do think yeah. I have the megalithic yeah. point. If you download the whole megalithic um KLM file, the big one, they've got it split down into small ones as well. But if you download the whole one, uh, I've got quite a meaty PC, and it just about stops it. Yep. it you yeah, you try to load up 50,000 Google Earth points all at once, and everything That's stops. Right. Yeah. 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 So you're still left with a map of the sky and a map of the ground. So how do you put them together? So just about any advanced graphics package will work. What you need in that package are layers. So you can have a uh, on the bottom layer, you can put the map of the ground. And on the layer above that, you can uh, put the map of the sky. Uh, and then you can resize or <coughs> uh, and move them, sort of rotate them round until you get the match. Uh, if you are resizing, just remember to keep the aspect ratio right, otherwise it'll screw up the entire thing. <laughs> um, you also need the ability to make layers or objects transparent or semi-transparent so you can see through them. So you want to be able to see through uh, the, the star layer onto the ground below. Um, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Um, and you want to be able to draw lines and simple shapes. I use a product called Inkscape, and I only use it because it's free. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's open source. It works. Yeah. Uh, it's quite complicated. Uh, if you want to do something, there's plenty of uh, tutorials on the internet. So let's put all this together. So here we have uh, the bottom layer is the map layer. Uh, and you can just about make it out here, but you can see that I've got the stars above it, uh, and you can see through that to the map below. So down here, we've got the devil's arrows in red, and we've got the hinges difficult to see up here in uh, in yellow. Um, and there's Canaban next to Alderbarn. Right, so that's difficult to see. Let's make it a bit easier. So that's as it maps out. So we've got the stars as stars. Uh, the hinges uh, are the relevant hinges uh, as red dots. So these three, that one there. We've got the devil's arrows as green uh, rectangles. Uh, now, the problem with this is scale, really, because the devil's arrows is quite a condensed area. Uh, whereas this is like 10.4 miles. So yeah. We're talking about a few few hundred feet down here. So a big view of it then. And I've expanded the devil's arrows there. On here, I've expanded the stars, otherwise they'd exactly cover these. Well, not exactly, but very, very closely cover it. You can't see the wood for the trees. Um, okay, I but, see. So the it it does look like the devil three the three remaining devil's arrows may line up sort of with three of the Pleiades yes. stars there. Yeah, yeah. They're not as accurate as I'd like them to be, but they're not far out. Yeah, I mean, they're pretty good. So let's talk about accuracy. So the way I did this is I got as accurate as I could at Thornbra. Uh, and that gave me this sort of layout at the Devil's Arrows. As I said, I pulled those out very slightly just so that the, you can see them. Yeah. 
Um, and then uh, if I look at Canabarn, which is the other hinge, the accuracy there is better than 100 feet. So it's just that is nearer, uh, nearer than 100 feet to there. So that on the total line is 0.18%. Okay, yeah, that's what I was going to ask, because if we're going across 10 miles and the accuracy is yeah. within 100, yeah, so that 0.18% accuracy, that's really good. Now, this next bit is interesting. So if I draw a line from the central hinge down to the Devil's Arrows, it, uh, it goes just above, or just to the um, uh, east of the southern hinge. But it's like over the... It... It's like a tangent along the circle there. It crosses the entrance. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it being a tangent is relevant, but if I do the same in the sky from uh, from Anilam to uh, the Pleiades, it goes just above Mintaka. Yep. So I would say... Oh, it's very similar. Pretty accurate. Yeah. Now... Is this just random chance? So I found this from Paul Devereaux, who you've probably heard of, um, who in 1989, he took this layout, not knowing anything about the stars, so the stars aren't relevant in this, and uh, tried to mimic it on uh, using a computer. And he ran 800 trials and he couldn't get anything similar. Now, I've not found exactly what he did there. <coughs> um, but it tells you something. What does that mean? That he, like, randomly was looking for random distributions of stones and see yes, if he could just yeah. get this Ran by accident? Ran randomly yeah. putting things down and seeing if he got lines like that, I Okay, think. okay, yeah. No. I have heard this like this, uh, and we need to take a break here in a minute, but uh, I have heard that, you know, people have been arguing about ley lines for a long time. Like, is this on purpose? Do these sites all line up for a reason or is it just... Can we, can we come back to that in episode three? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can. Yeah. I just, you know, the, the, the classic, the standard SCURP argument is like, well, you could you could draw lines across any number of sites. You know, it isn't anything special. You know, yes, I've, you... I've got I've got some views on that. And All right. The scurp argument actually isn't a bad argument. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's take this is awesome, man. Let's take another break. Yeah. We'll be right now, back. Can we just finish this slide? Oh yeah, sure. sure. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So you remember I said that we were the we we were the within a hundred feet. Yeah. Yes. Uh, both up here, here, and down here. Well. If you think about it, uh, it, that 100 feet could be either side of the monuments. So the accuracy is uh, within a square that's 200 foot wide. Yeah? Yeah. And, well, 200 foot on a side. Yeah. Um, now, there are 42,000 of those within a square like this. Hmm. So of any one of these, so I've only assumed that there are three objects. So there's the belt stars. You get the belt stars right. Uh, it's one chance in 42,000. You get the Pleiades right. That's one chance in 42,000. And so it is with Aldemar. So you multiply those together and you get a number uh, which is a six followed by 13 zero. Ah, so okay, the chances yeah. against <laughs> this being random uh bloody enormous. <laughs> <laughs> i love this this is this is a lot, lot like what um martin, uh, martin sweatman. sweatman did with the uh yeah. go back with tepe yeah. analysis that's cool now can i just say that it's 50 years since i did um, uh, any statistics so I'm sure that a statistician can pick holes in this <laughs> but it gives you an idea and in fact if you just tried to lay out objects on a line that long within 200 uh, feet squares uh, the odds are still pretty high against it being right right yep that's awesome wow okay 
Cool. Okay. Now, now we, we take a break. Now we can take a break, yeah. above so below here on brothers of the servant podcast looking at uk megaliths with megalithic martin from the discord uh random arrangements or not i don't it doesn't you're you're convincing me that this is not random i love this yeah. man i i don't think this is random at all uh, this actually i mean there's a lot of other stuff but this is one of the most convincing arguments for there being something there yeah uh i then went on to look at the devil's arrows can we look at can we find the missing stones um this is the arrangement of the pleiades uh as they would be if they were laid out in this sort mm. of north south direction uh and I found some extracts from texts from the 15th, 15th and 16th century, uh, but they're confusing to read uh, and it's difficult to understand what it says. So there's an extract here. I mean, you can make oh, yeah. all sorts of things from this. Uh, my interpretation is, so the ones we've got are this one, this one, and this one. My interpretation is one of the missing ones was down here and was Mario. Um, and one was down here, and those were when there were five there, which appears to be what he's talking about here. I don't understand this fourth stone near the current central one. Um, <clears throat> I think it was it, it, what they're probably talking about is these two down here, but you know, the, the old texts that have been copied several times, so mm. there might be totally wrong uh but it gives you an idea of how it would uh, pan out so if we had decent lidar we might be able to see some of these uh, these pits mm. but the lidar definition is not very good at all mm. so the river you another challenge <laughs> somebody needs to do some <laughs> yes. lidar over there yeah yeah the River Ewer and the Henges. So the River Ewer is, um, I think you saw on the original map, the ex expanded map, that there are two big, biggish rivers, uh, one to the east and one to the west. River Ewer is the one to the west, and it's quite close to the Henge site. It's had several names, including the Isis at one mm. time, which I think is interesting. So this is... The river these are the hinges you'll see why i've marked that on in a moment so this is ryan's belt this is the milky way oh okay so the red uh, line is the yeah yep reasonably convincing yeah interesting now this might add to it actually so you comes from the old british word the uh, holy one <laughs> So there's some hmm. significance in the river as well. So the implication of this is that the river was a, a stand-in for the for the Milky Way. Is that the idea? Yeah. 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 If you remember, Robert Baval suggested that the Nile represented. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And we'll come to that in a minute. So, is this possible at all? Well. The belt stars are the three most recognizable stars in the sky. Anyone that, uh, well, not anyone, but anyone that knows anything about the stars will know about Orion's belt. There are lots and lots of ancient legends, as we've talked about, <coughs> including one claimed to be the oldest in the world. There are several sites around the world that claim to be aligned to uh, Orion's belt, and there's uh, for their 
and I I know of at least two more. Uh, a couple of them I've checked actually. The stones of Stennis, uh, and then these you know me <coughs> are pretty accurate. And there is a monument <coughs> uh, to the southwest of there that looks as though it lines up with I can't remember what the star was now, but one of the other stars. Trouble is that. Um, the size or the distance between them is big, so it makes the entire map uh, big, and it's quite difficult understanding it uh, or getting the stars and the map together so yeah. that they sort of correlate. Uh, so I think it makes complete sense that we have something of that nature. So I ho hope I've convinced you of something there. Now, if I have, you're also going to have to agree with this, I think. So these people would have needed a stable society. If you're always fighting wars, you're never going to do anything like this, uh, particularly with the population levels that they had then. But the most also have had expertise in all these other areas. And, you know, how on earth yeah. did they do it? Yeah, ast <laughs> astronomy, surveying, building techniques, engineering, yeah. architecture, mathematics, yeah. and labor force management. Yes. Yep. Yep. So just that one piece of the puzzle that I've put together, and, you know, it's, it's not me being brilliant. All of this has sort of fallen into my uh, my hands, as it were. Um, there were a couple of people talking on uh, on the Discord about, I wish I lived in an interesting area. <laughs> well, when I joined the Discord, I'd been watching Ramble and looking at the uh, Scablands and all those mounds in America and all the rest of it, and I thought, it'd be nice to live somewhere interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then... I do live somewhere interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we moved down here. I live near Nottingham now. Uh, I used to live near Halifax, which is on the Yorkshire Moors. Um, moved to down near Nottingham. And one of the first things I saw when I was out with a dog was these things that look like, um, you know, the lines that water leaves on the, the side of... Yeah, the strand uh, lines. Yeah. Strand lines, yeah, yeah strand lines. And I thought, I wonder if there's, there could be strand lines. So we had a couple of discussions in the uh, in the Discord. The consensus was, no, nah, it's lines left by sheep. So <laughs> I managed I managed to follow on with um, on Google Earth and plot it along, and it had a dead flat. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that led me to. We are on the uh, on on the bed of this ancient glacial lake, and there's a strand line. All like right. That. Oh, cool. Yeah. And there's also all sorts of other stuff around here. So anyone listening to this, don't be down disheartened that you live in a boring area because you don't. <laughs> you just don't know what's there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. So that's great. Yeah. Is there anything else out there that might be similar? So. We know about Robert Bavall's work, so here we go. I think that is a really superb picture. Yeah, wow. <laughs> um, so for those that don't know, the Orion correlation is the idea that the pyramids on the Giza plateau are laid out to represent uh, Orion on the ground. Uh, so as I said, it's Robert Bavall. This is my layout of it. So these are the stars put together in the same way. Um, and those are the pyramids. Hmm. So the uh, alignment of Minkar is a little off. It is a little off. It's about the same distance off as the henge at uh, oh. Thornbrook. I think, I think getting them dead accurate is, is, is not easy. Or... Yeah. And... I also think that... Or it's moved. Or it's moved. That's what I was thinking, too. Yeah. They're both off about the same amount. <laughs> yes. In the same direction. Yeah, yeah. And our, how... Which well. may, maybe uh, our knowledge of the movements of stars uh, 
not as good as what we think they are. Yeah. Who knows? Uh, so, obviously, the idea is contentious, and some people have even stooped to claiming, oh, well, it came from Edgar Casey, so it must be bollocks. Pardon the expression. <laughs> well, if you stoop into that level. But 10,500 BC... Uh, a whisker after the start of the YD, YD so maybe Casey was onto something. Hmm. Right, so is there a star map there? So are there any other stars mapped? So we start with this line again. Uh, if we look at this line, we see that if if there are, there are going to be stars around this line because Orion is in that line. So we're looking for Sirius... Uh, the Hades and the Pleiades. But there is a problem. So if we draw, if we line up uh, the Orion's belt with the uh, pyramids, we can see that Sirius would be in the desert, or if it was the other way up, Pleiades would be in the desert, uh, and the Pleiades would be in the Nile. Nile down right. here and curves round here. So there is a problem there. So the only way they could have done this is if they'd rotated the, the layout of the sky. So if they'd built these first and then thought, oh, well, we can add some, we can add Sirius and we can add um, Alderbaran and so on and so forth. But we're going to have to do it at right angles more or less to what we've already done is there any evidence for that because that's where the evidence is going to be well these are the pyramids that are in that area this is from uh, megalithic.co.uk by the way it's the uh, klm or klg or whatever the foul name's called <laughs> KML. Uh, these are the stars so you can see sirius at the bottom now, there are two groupings here. So there's the Pleiades, there's the Hyades, and there are three groups of pyramids. So can we get some sort of match on those? We put it together with Sirius being at um, Def Defra, <laughs> Defra's pyramid. Uh, get the... Um, Orion's belt as near as possible here and you finish up with the Pleiades on Saqqara yeah and uh, the Hyades on this group here so basically what that says and there's the Nile as well so looks as though there might be something there but if we take the map away and then look at it i think that looks pretty good yeah it does yeah huh. um i might not have the distance that way as accurate as well i might not have it as they had it i mean it's it's there so it might all move up slightly in which case the Giza pyramids would be nearer it might also move that way a little bit. In that case, these two would probably overlap. Uh, Tabit would be near here, and we'd get a, a better match there. But I think that looks pretty good. And I would almost be convinced that the, we're trying to do something like that. Uh, I know that, and I didn't find this out until quite a while after I'd done this, but someone has proposed something similar on Hancock's site. So I've not read it, so I don't know what it says. <clears throat> What's did you did you give an explanation for the different angle of the Giza pyramid? Like they turned the whole map? Well is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, turn they turn the whole map, yeah. Okay. I think this if if you don't turn the whole map uh, shouldn't have done that, should I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, from current slide. If you don't turn the whole map, you finish up with pyramids in the desert. And way pyramid. out in the desert, okay, yeah. And, yeah, way out in the desert and pyramids in the Nile. So. Well, I have a possible 
explanation for the opposite angle. Mm-hmm. If you were in the sky looking down at the pyramids, they would be in the same angle as if you were on the ground looking up at yeah, yeah. Orion's belt. It depends belt. which way you depends which way you fold the sky. Yeah, do you do you ground. want to mirror the sky like in other words if you're far away looking at the pyramids and, and looking, looking at, the stars, at the stars, are they the same? Or is it if you're from the sky looking at the pyramids yeah. as though they're the stars in the sky, they would have to be yeah. the opposite yeah. layout th- yeah. to see it as you are standing on the ground looking at the stars. Yeah, so you're, it's projected as a mirror. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. I mean, I have a different picture of it because I, I think that you – you have the sky there, and you can fold it down that way onto the ground, or you can bring it down this way onto the yeah, ground. Yeah, you can lay it. You can oh, bring yeah, it down yeah. and lay it, or you can fold it down and lay it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In either case, if you're looking at it, a projection of it, Orion's belt and the pyramids go up and to the right. Yeah. Well, and one of the you know one of the um, sort of classic ways that. Uh, some ancients would study the sky is with a water mirror. So you have wow. a you have a very thin a very yeah. thin pool of water in a bowl or something, and, and that way you don't have to spend all night with your neck back. You oh can just, man, this is how I have to do it now. You look down at the bowl, hey. and you and it's a perfect mirror at night if you've got the angle right, and if it's a very thin, you know, and, so, and you can just study the stars in an easy way. And it that's, is that's cool. It, isn't yeah, it, it that is, is a mirror. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so back to Thornborough then. So the standard age I want to talk about. So this is what uh, archaeologists actually think. And what they think actually isn't too inaccurate, I don't think. So they did, there's all sorts of dates for the Henges between 3,500 and 1,800. Uh, but the preferred date seems to be about 2,8. Uh, as I say, I don't think that's too bad. Um, the area around Thornborough was used at least back to 4000 BC, and the Cersus there dating to 3500 BC. So Cersus is a, I want to say it's a straight line. It's like a, a street with uh, walls on each side. Oh, okay. Uh, earth, earth walls, earth embankments on each side. Some of them are straight. And... So, like a, uh, uh, like a protected roadway or something, or a yeah, we have like a canal. Some of them are very short though, so we uh, have no idea why we they were, were talking, built. We were just talking about these on the recorded Cosmographia show. What was Randall calling them? Oh. A, a something way, like it was a... Yeah, a, like a causeway? Like, you're talking about the causeways? or No, I, I don't know. What you're, you're talking about for the American Earthworks he was yeah, talking about. Yeah, yeah. It's not published yet. But yeah, there's they, the same thing in the American Earthworks. They have these two mounds that run along, and there's a, you know, like a road between them. Yeah. Mm, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's a like A graded that. way is what they were yeah. called. Yeah, great way. Uh, right, yeah. yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, when you were showing us pictures of those hinges, it was it struck me how similar yes. they are to these yeah. these hinges we have here. I mean, they're basically hinges. They're I, hinges. That's they what I'm saying. They have the ditch and everything. American hinges. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, ob- ob- obviously no one traveled across the Atlantic. Anymore. Right, yeah. No, no, of course no, not. no, no. It's, it's, it's like <laughs> beavers building a dam. You just do it the same way everywhere. Hinges are hinges, hinges no matter <laughs> no matter where you build them. It's just the most natural way to make a hinge. Uh, so English heritage claims, oh, says the site was used at least from 4000 BC, as I said. Uh, but there is evidence that it was used substantially before that. Wow. I mean, I've seen dates. Well, I've put 8,000 there, but I've certainly seen dates going back to 7,500. So the site is old. Uh, and there have been lots and lots of stone tools and such things found in, all around this area. Um. Now we can we know that uh, the stars of Taurus are actually represented in the map, 
Uh, the age of Taurus was 4,300 to 2,150, and that pretty much agrees with the date, uh, the build date. Mm. So, starting date for the Great Pyramid was supposedly 2,650. No one really knows, of course. Yeah, Yorkshire was early. <laughs> <laughs> Beat him to the punch. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you my possible dates later on. <laughs> ah, okay. We'll get to that later. Uh, now for the woo-woo. <laughs> Excellent. So is could there be a connection between Yorkshire and Egypt? So the Devil's Arrow's latitude is 54 degrees, which doesn't sound anything amazing, but it's actually three-fifths of 90 degrees. Uh, Giza is a third of uh, the distance from the pole to the equator, so it's 30 degrees, near enough. It's also the number of um, cards in a deck with the Jokers. Right? Say again? 54 cards in a deck if you include the Jokers. Yeah, too. yeah. I, mean, I don't know if that means anything. <laughs> I wonder why there are 54. Yeah. Something to do with 13 plus 2 <laughs> Hmm. 52 weeks in a year? Yeah, 52. Yeah. So the angular distance between the sites is a sort of roundish number, 24 degrees. Uh, so it's the 30th of a full circle. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, they both have three monuments, which Orion's built to the ground. They're both part of a bigger star map. Uh, both had walls that were coated in white. So at Thornborough, they coated the outside walls of the hinges in gypsum. Ah. So sort of white, um, uh, sort of chalky, chalky material. Yeah, like. yeah. yeah. Uh, now they went on by Sirac Giza because they're a bit posher down there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and had polished limestone. Uh, the angle of Menkara's pyramid is 51.33 degrees. That main alignment from Thumbra to the Devil's Arrows, well, we always measure from north, so it's 141.2 degrees. Uh, but I think there is evidence that they measured from east, and it is 51.2 degrees. The angle of the Great Pyramid is 51.8. Hmm. So I thought all the pyramids would have the same angle, but they don't. No. So, in Egyptian mythology, Osiris is represented uh, by Orion and, and Taurus by, uh, sorry, Taurus is Horus. Nice, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And in fact, I've seen somewhere that the eye of Taurus is Aldebaran. So, in Egyptian mythology, behold, he has... He has come as Orion. Behold, Osiris has come as Orion. O king, the sky conceives you with Orion. The dawn light bears you with Orion, and so on and so forth. So quite clearly, they had a thing about Orion. Um, both sites used the river to represent the Milky Way. The river Ewer in Yorkshire was once called the Isis. <laughs> <laughs> and the arrangement in Yorkshire is slightly more accurate. It's not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So you'll see in the next bit, in a couple of slides, that there appears to have been a fairly common culture across uh, Western Europe in that period. Uh, and the only way you can have that is to have uh, travel between the uh, location centres. Uh, so it's probably sea travel. Uh, I think I think there was some contact between Egypt uh, and um, certainly England. And there is a tale of a, an Egyptian princess in Scotland. Oh. Uh, uh, Pete could tell you more on that, actually, because he's just been reading about it. So. I also found this on um, ResearchGate. 
So there's a paper called From New Grave to Stonehenge, Monuments of a Bull Cult and Origins. Uh, the Egyptian pyramid construction at, Gie, at the Giza Plateau were influenced by the megalithic building techniques, engineering, architecture, mathematics and astronomical advances um, from uh, the Western Europe Neolithic people. So I'm not the first person to think this. Might not be right. But <laughs> so who were these people? So Ice Age Britain, so uh, this is quite nice actually. It shows the variations in ice cover over 27,000, 2300, 19 and 18 and 23 is the maximum depth of the Ice Age. Uh, these monuments are all about here. So they were well covered in ice during this period. Okay. And not only that, but as the ice melted, you'll see here that the, uh, this is the ice lobe coming down here. Uh, and the Devil's Arrows are here. And um, the Thornborough Henges, uh, sorry, Devil's Arrows are here, the Thornborough Henges are up here. Um, once again, covered in ice. And as the ice melted, this became this glacial lake I've referred to. So I live down here, the hinges uh, up here. So no one lived where, lived there for a long, long time. It was impossible to live there unless you lived on top of the ice or were pretty good at diving. <laughs> So Britain was almost unpopulated during the depths of the Ice Age. Uh, the earliest remains that have been found so far are uh, Cheddar Man. Yeah. So there's a debate about skin colour, uh, and it certainly seems, if you look at it, that the genes for white skin evolved sometime after this, and it seems to be from a mixture of the this particular YouTube video on the bottom is very, very good on this, actually, uh, the whole history of all of this. Um, and uh, seems to be mixing uh, of people who were already here led to white skin. Um, I don't understand why, but this guy specifically says there's no evidence of white skinned people coming into Europe, so it must have evolved here. Hmm. Um, now, those were the people that were immediately pre-Ice Age. They were replaced almost completely uh, 6,000 years ago. That's 4,000 BC. Remember, we said these people started uh, coming into England or Britain in 4,000 BC. Only 1% of Cheddar Man's genes were passed on to the new population. So quite what happened there, you've got to ask. It does appear as though these Neolithic people were not warlike, though. We have found very little evidence of uh, violence and wars during that period. Um, so these Neolithic people were the Megalithic, me megalithic builders, and I've called them the hedge builders in my posts. What, so. what would be considered evidence of war though like people like uh bones with injuries i mean because yeah bones with injuries okay. generally yeah okay uh i sometimes think that archaeologists are not too interested in pre-roman britain anyway you know mm. i mean they all get really excited about finding another roman mosaic pavement, pavement. <laughs> yeah but no one cares about this stuff uh, uh, Sheffield University, their school of archaeology is in danger of being closed down. And I suspect it's because they're not doing relevant stuff. If they were doing stuff like this, local people might be interested. Yeah. Is it is it considered like pretty much case closed on these people and what they were doing there? No, I just don't think anyone's interested. Ah, man. Well, they need to join the Discord. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, 
So they don't think that they where, live where, in an interesting you, place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so where did these people come from? Well, there have been a number of waves of migration from Anatolia, and that's Turkey, to you people that don't know, oh. uh, and the Black Sea area. Um, the Neolithic builders were the, was the second biggest my biggest my oh, big migration. And you can see that they set off around here, somewhere around about, I guess, 9,600. So pretty much right at the end of the Younger Dryas. Uh, and slowly spread across Europe. They split into two waves, one going this way and one going this way. And the two waves got to Britain at different times, but... Um, wow, I mean, maybe you're came... maybe you're going there, but like these stone circles coming from Anatolia, people coming from Anatolia around yeah. that time. I mean, hey, yeah, seems legit. Yep. Yeah, they have found stone circles and henge type monuments in this area as well, so, which is interesting in itself. And of course, we all know about the Turkish stuff. Yeah. And uh, so this new population in 4000 BC were late Stone Age and the first farmers. So I found this little quote somewhere: "Ancient Greeks were the first were Britain's first farmers." <laughs> Because they came from down in. <laughs> uh, life was hard. Lifespans averaged about 35 years. Little evidence of warfare. But as I said, I think that's mainly because uh, we haven't looked a lot. This is the location of standing stones as shown in... Um... Oh, my God. Look at that. <laughs> wow. as, as shown in megalithic.co.uk. And you can see that it's all around here, there's a cluster here, cluster here. So that would lead me to believe that there was a sort of common culture. Uh, change, these styles change a bit over, over time and over distance. Uh, but it looks as though that culture was centred around uh, Normandy and northern France. And you might just think that Karnak might have been the centre. Karnak, yeah. Now, I have a question about this Ice Age, like this period. Um, were the sea levels much lower during this period um, of migration? Because, you know, I the sea levels rose quite a bit. Uh, yeah, following the, the, end of the main, main sea level rise was before this period. Okay. So... Um, I mean, sea level is still rising. It's rising at an almost constant rate. So I don't believe people who tell you we're going to be drowned shortly. <laughs> um, and that rate has changed very little over the last 150 years. Uh, in fact, it's changed very little over the last 5,000 Five years, out, apart yeah. from the Little Ice Age. Actually, mm -hmm. sea levels... Uh, um, dropped a little because the uh, glaciers moved forwards. Uh, the main bulk of the rise stopped at about 6000 BC, so a little before this period. Okay. Uh, and the English Channel was supposed to have been recreated, so it's been in existence and out of existence several times. Um, somewhere around about the uh, end of the Younger Dryas from all counts. And I don't know how much evidence there is of that. But they had to have sea travel to get to England. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And, you know, cr crossing the, uh, the English Channel isn't that easy. It's not easy. If you buy, if you buy yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you've got reasonable technology. Right. Well, is this a good place to take a break? We got one more yep, break yep. here. Uh, we're not not that far to go, actually, but let's take a break anyway. Uh, okay. I'm, yeah. So. Take a break Alrighty. and come back for the last segment. And the uh, I'm I'm glad this is going to continue. We've got Me too. several more, maybe one, at least one, maybe two 
maybe three. Who knows? We'll see. More episodes coming five. up with, with my five. five <laughs> three set. <laughs> All right, we'll be we'll be right back. <laughs> back, ladies and gentlemen, for the final segment. I was going to say, I, I looked this up um, about the Pleiades. I can't find anything about distances between individual stars, but the cluster itself has an approximate radius of seven light years. So you mm. think of a 14 well, ra- light year diameter with, th- with thousands of stars in it. Yeah. Only 14 year light years across. So they uh, they can be close. That's cool. Yeah. Be cool to live in an interesting place. Part like of the that. universe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You do. <laughs> it, might, it might even be too interesting. We'll find out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Are we going? Yes. Yes. Let's go. Please oh, continue, right. sir. Right. Right. Okay. Right. So we've seen that uh, these people came in about 4000 BC. Um, They were pretty advanced people, I think, from the uh, evidence of their work. Uh, And they were probably, they're thought to be peaceful. And I don't think you build monuments like this if you uh, are continually fighting. So they probably were relatively peaceful. Um, But what happened happened to them in the end? Well, their population numbers seem to have peaked uh, around about 3000 BC, Um, or maybe running a bit later than that. And if you remember the date for the build of these, or the standard model date for the build, uh, of a lot of these monuments is about 2,800. Uh, Stonehenge was started, I think, 3,100 or something like that. But there was stuff on the site before then. Um, but somewhere between 2,700 and 2,300, uh, these people nearly completely vanished. And this is interesting, actually, because... These are the Neolithic people down here, and uh, uh, the population numbers, this is by percentage of population that we've found. Uh, And you can see that all of a sudden, at this point here, it suddenly changes, and the population profile changes almost totally. You can also see that uh, these uh, white uh, ring dots uh, the female population, um, and and they're oh. the female population of uh, the, the henge builders. You can see that the women managed to survive better than the men, mm. which so... is, is somewhat interesting. Now, we also have uh, information on what happened in Spain. So we know the Beaker people started to move into Britain about 2,400. Uh, and in fact, this is just about exactly there, where that line, the first line is there. Uh, in Spain, it was a little later, so the Neolithic population went down to here. Um, but the population that went on was only a 40% replacement, but all of the remaining people from this population were women. Hmm. So we have a conundrum. Why do people vanish? So, But first of all, let's just cover the beta people, because when I was young, I can remember they uh, were quite popular in uh, uh, in books and 
writing and about archaeology and stuff, and you hardly ever hear about them anymore. As I say, they're not Roman, so they don't get any uh, publicity. Uh, they're not Roman, they're not Tudor, no one's interested. <laughs> So these were the next people who spread uh, out of um, the Black Sea area. Uh, and you can see they came in about 2,400. They were the first Bronze Age people. Um, they appear to have had a much more hierarchical society from what we can see, and a much more male-dominated society. Uh, so as they moved in, uh, and this is a quote from one of the, uh, not made a reference where I got the quote from, sadly, but uh, there was significant male DNA population replacement in Europe. Could have been various reasons for why this happened. Uh, so it, the, these these people were, uh, are now called the um, Yam, can't pronounce it, but you can Yamnaya. read it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the idea is that because they were warlike, these men invaded the village, killed all the men and took the women. And that does appear to be certainly what happened in Spain from uh, that DNA analysis, and maybe in England as well. So possible fates. So the Beaker people, it might be more or less ethnic cleansing, but you take the women because, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Interestingly, the earliest plague victims that we know about date to about 3000 BC and they're in the Beaker people population. So maybe when they came, they also brought the Black Death. Mm. Now, there was also a cooling period that started about 3000 BC and ran to about 2700. So nowadays we don't worry too much about cooling we're not panicking about heating in fact we're the first um uh culture that has ever worried about the world getting warmer i think <laughs> because when it gets colder your crops fail yes <laughs> and you die yes um and then finally we have the two three four five bc event uh and the late third millennium decline so just a quick bit on 2345 it was the one of the worst tree ring uh, thickness record uh, day, years on record um, but if you look at the tree ring record you can see it wasn't just 2345 uh, it started about 239 something or other um, and all of this is is bad so the year without a summer uh, 1816 the average tree ring thickness in that year was 100 millimeters oh oh, oh yeah Actually, that's bad yeah so you can see that all of those are below that hmm. so that's pretty bad so after that, you get a really bad period as well. So this is a longer term view of it. And you can see that this is the average tree ring. All of this period here is yeah. pretty awful. And this period as well. So that's the year without the summer. In Ireland, um, the... Um, the ancient writings say that there was a 20-year-long uh, period of rainfall in Ireland and the whole of Ireland had to be evacuated. Wow. Now, I suspect it, it didn't continue for solidly for 20 years, but, you know, it's yeah. certainly heavier rainfall than we, uh, we ever thought. George Dodwell, now, an interesting character. He was... Um, an Australian uh, astronomer from the early 20th century, um, a very religious man, and wanted to prove that the uh, the flood had been on this day. Uh, what he did was he found old uh, sundials, and you know the sticking up bit. Mm -hmm. um, that depends on you know, the location where you are, 
uh, and because it's got to go by the height of the sun. Right. Uh, and he concluded that over the years uh, that that uh, the angle of that had changed, and it had changed in a sort of regular pattern. Uh, so he thought that he could track this back to two, three, four, five, uh, and thought that uh, the Earth's axis had shifted in two, three, four, five, and had spent time since recovering. Wow. Um, well, could that also be uh, crustal displacement? Like that the crust maybe... Yes, yeah, 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 it could yeah. be, exactly, yeah. It doesn't yeah. have to be the actual axis. No, no. Uh, Bishop Usher dated Noah's flood to 2349. Now, Bishop Usher was the man who famously uh, uh, dated the Earth's creation to 4004 BC, uh, and everyone thinks he's stupid now, but uh, if you read about him, he was a very intelligent man, knew a lot, um, but was a very dedicated Christian. Nothing wrong with that. Um, so he dated the flood to that date. But other things happened in 2345. So the fifth dynasty in Egypt ends in that year, uh, and the old kingdom peters out slowly after that, goes on for another hundred or so years, and then finishes. Um, the last temples in Malta were built around that day. Oh, wow. uh, the Orkney Neolithic builders vanished around that day. Wow. Uh, 2350, there was a near simultaneous collapse, which saw great societies crumble. Uh, the end of the early din 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 anyway, period in Mesopotamia. <laughs> um, and that's underlined by Sargon, Sargon of uh, Akkad, uh, began his conquering in 20-odd uh, years after that. So the new people coming in after, probably into a deserted uh, area of the world. Mm -hmm. um, Chinese Emperor Yao presided over catastrophic floods uh, and a 20-year period of flooding, which wow. very similar to Ireland, if you think about wow. it. So maybe it was a hemispherical event. <laughs> uh, also in China, the uh, Liangzhu culture collapsed uh, with an anomalously wet period around that date. Chinese legends speak of multiple suns in the sky and flying dragon and nine years of flooding. Wow. It's freaking awesome. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, so they've done some analysis of some, I mean, I, I suspect this is rubbish actually, but uh, of satellite imagery of a place in southern Iraq and suggests that it could be a possible impact crater. Mm. So this was a graph that someone put together of population levels in Europe. And in the start in 10,000 BC, and you can see that there was a peak around about um, 5,700, that's 3,700 BC, and then a collapse. And then this, a recovery here, this is when the hinges were built, and then another collapse down here at 2345. So it does look as though something was going on. So, what do I think? I, I think the Beaker people certainly killed a lot of them. I think plague killed a lot of them. I think um, uh, starvation killed a lot of them. And if there were any left, two, three, four, five, finished them. Mm. Wow. So... Through to a summary then, there's just a couple of little stories I want to mention before we go on. Um, so I've been talking obviously on the Discord about the Devil's Arrows being a Pleiades. Um, 
and Shannon had suggested that maybe some of the things I was seeing were ley lines. So I investigated ley lines, but couldn't make head and tail of them really. Um, and then I went on to a bit on dowsing. Uh, dowsing was interesting, actually. You'll see how all this fits together in a minute. All right. Um, so I got two two metal rods that my wife used to stake out plants from the garden and bent them at right angles. She wasn't very pleased, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the first thing you've got to do is try and build a relationship with them. And you do that by saying, uh, show me a yes. So, mm. so you hold them, show me a yes. So nothing happens. So you keep doing that, keep doing that, keep doing that. So I got up to 10, nothing had happened. Got up to 20, nothing had happened. Up to 40, still nothing had happened. <laughs> So about the 50th attempt, just as I was about to throw him back in the garage, <laughs> there was a very slight movement. I thought, that's odd. That must be, must, must, must be my imagination. But I tried again, and they moved a bit quicker, and tried again, and they moved quicker. And eventually, I was getting a response every time. Show me, show me a no. Wow. Show me a no. Um, so something was happening there. I'm sure I wasn't moving them. Um, so I thought, I didn't know why the hinges and the stones had been built, but there's all these tall tales about earth energies. So I thought, well, I've got to go there and see. Uh, and I've been talking to this dowsing lady on the internet. And she was talking about the lines of power, but she was also talking about PowerPoints. Uh, so it's a place, like a circular place, where um, I envisage it totally different from what she does. I envisage it, you know, you know what a spring of water is like, so it bubbles out the ground. Yeah. And you know what a water sink's like, because you live in the limestone area, so you must have been yeah. seen water sinks where the water just vanishes into the ground mm -hmm. so that's how i envisage it but she didn't think of it like that at all and i also think of these power lines running down between these power points um so i was getting ready to go i mean uh, i live in nottingham so it's a bit of a drive uh, but I've got some friends who uh, I used to uh, work with that we meet once a month for a beer and a curry. Uh, and they live in Yorkshire, so I, I decided to go one of the, the beer curry nights. Uh, and just before that, Shannon decided that she was going to go to the Pleiades uh, and she was going to take... Uh, uh, a picnic with her and have a nice day out. Uh, anyone listening who wants a picnic, they'd be better going to Thornborough, by the way, because uh, the Devil's Arrows is really a farmer's field now. So it's not going to be too impressed by you trampling all over it and <laughs> opening your bottles of champagne or beer. <laughs> Wait, how, anyway, she, how, how, hold up one second. What, how far is a bit of a drive? Like, how many miles are you talking here? Oh, it's nothing compared to what you guys think. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's like, uh, it's about two hours from here up to the Devil's Arrow. Oh, okay. So, I mean, it's when I was younger and working, and uh, I did a lot of driving, and I wouldn't worry twice about driving two hours. Yeah. But I'm a bit older and. <laughs> <laughs> a bit more reluctant to do it now. All right. <laughs> uh, so she went there and they were doing some dowsing and they found some interesting stuff. Uh, and where you get in from the road is uh, between the two big ones. And they went down towards the small one, which is the uh, <coughs> the southern one. And all of a sudden, the, uh, the, the rods went mad. Uh, going all over the place. And then um, Shannon tells this tale 
about getting almost like an electric shock. Yes. Yeah, you might have heard this story before. Um, and a, a feeling of real evil or real being pushed away. Uh, so they left and went somewhere else. I think they went to a pub for lunch or something. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think was probably the best plan anyway. <laughs> have a look around and then go to the pub. <laughs> uh, so I went down there uh, and I think I found a power line going from the Southern Henge uh, towards the central one. And the ground's all a bit muddy, so it's difficult to follow them, you know, you prefer to walk on the grass around the edge yeah. uh, and just intercept it at places. Uh, but I got to the central one, it still seemed to be there, and it seemed to be going to the southern one. Uh, and I got to the southern one, uh, and I'd already had this discussion where this woman had discussed PowerPoints with me. So I said to the rods, is there a PowerPoint near here? Uh, and it said yes. So... I said, well, point me the direction. And it pointed a bit to the east, uh, about six or seven yards to the east of the southern uh, stone. Uh, don't forget that you can't see anything here, so I'm always suspicious that just my imagination always. Yeah. Uh, but I contacted Shannon after. And where, where did this event that you had happen well it was near that littler stone mm. which side of it well it was the side nearest the houses which is the eastern side ah, <laughs> interesting so something going on there and then i got to thornborough uh, and i followed i thought there'd be a power line going right from the central hinge all the way to the northern well, it doesn't go all the way. It vanishes before it gets there. So it's either a, a sink or a rise in my terms. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the middle of the central hinge, there seems to be an, an enormous power point. So I got it to tell me the size of it. So at the Devil's Arrows, it was quite small, you know, a couple of foot across, as far as I could tell. But here it was 20 feet across wow and um, and then i followed this line all the way down to the southern hinge and by following it i just checked occasionally whether i was on the line or not and, you know, uh so you know, walk walk 100 feet or so and am i still on the line yes walk another 100 feet am i still on the line yes and then at some point I said, am I still on the line? It said, no. So I thought, oh, that's odd. Uh, show me the direction of the line. So it took me westwards, uh, and I kept saying, so I'd walk at, I don't know, five feet, oh, a bit more, and say, am I on the line or not? Uh, and he kept saying no, and then eventually it said yes. So looking up then, I could see that I was on the line between the entrances of the southern hinge and the, and the central hinge. I was dead in the middle of that line, and I'd wandered off by oh, a couple of hundred feet without realising it. Oh. That actually convinced me that there's something happening there. You know, there's, I am picking up something. <laughs> what <laughs> it is, cool. I, I don't know. Yeah. But I just thought that was an interesting tale. And probably told better told at the end rather than the beginning. Yeah, no, that's that is fascinating. Mm. I I've wanted to try dowsing like you know more in depth like that. So yeah, that is awesome. Yeah, yeah. I think I think Russ's dowsing was his first dowsing attempt was successful. <laughs> it was successful. <laughs> I thought it was a failure. <laughs> he, he we we were looking for an electrical line. Yeah. And I yeah. was like, I know the electrical line is in this area because it's under the there's ground the electrical somewhere. box. Yeah. And then here's the shop. And the line has to come through here. So he was like, 
we had already hired a company to come out and survey it with the whatever magnetic device to find it. And he was like, well, I'm going to go to Dow's first <laughs> and see where I think and see if I can find out where it is. And then it will get confirmation uh, with the actual instrument. So he went out there and he spent like 30, 45 minutes. He finally comes back and he's like, this doesn't work. I can't find it. Yeah. It's not doing anything. I, like, I just, I threw the rods yeah. down. Like it's, I don't, I'm not getting anything. So then <laughs> a couple of days later, the guys show up and they run that machine all over the whole place. There's no electrical line. Here. <laughs> <laughs> we end up finding out it goes in this really strange yeah, way it's, off. It's... And it goes under the driveway and I'm like, Oh, so I guess you, you, had successfully doused. Yeah. We could have we could have trenched anywhere we wanted out there and we never would have hit an electrical yeah. line. <laughs> I thought it was a failure because I didn't get a line, but it was a success because the line isn't there. <laughs> the the problem is is knowing what a success and failure is, isn't it? Yes. Because certainly with these power line ideas. I mean they might not exist at all, so it might all be fantasy and it's Yeah. It's tough but, to say. Yeah, yeah. That's very cool okay, that you did that. so quick summary then. So we've talked about Thornborough and uh, the Belt Stars of Orion and uh, Thornborough matching that. And we've talked about the Pleiades and a lot about the legends of the Pleiades. Um, we've drawn a Yorkshire Starmer, which I hope I've convinced everyone uh, is an accurate map of the stars. It's a different scale to the sky, by the way, because the uh, angular distance between the Pleiades uh, and the central star of the belt is 36 degrees, which is 10% of a circle. And the distance between the Devil's Arrows and Thombra is 10.4 miles, so it's nowhere near 30% of the circumference of the Earth. Yeah. So they've scaled it down which, if you think about it, is what you would expect to do. Otherwise, you're going to be building monuments that are thousands of miles apart. Right. Uh, we've looked at a possible Egyptian star map, uh, and we've discussed whether there might be links between the Neolithic builders and Egypt. And then we've spent a bit of time looking at who these people were. So... Next time. So, next time I'm staying in Yorkshire. Um, he doesn't like to leave Yorkshire. He doesn't like to go anywhere. <laughs> well, we do get out of Yorkshire eventually. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see France yet. <laughs> um, so, why, why is it built where it is? So there's that funny V-shape, uh, and there have been lots of people, if if you Google it, there's lots of people with lots of ideas, and uh, not many of them very convincing, but why is it there? So there is a legend of why it's there, and uh, Shannon mentioned this in her um, uh, episode 209, and... Um, it's about the devil standing on a hill and throwing rocks at a nearby town. Uh, uh, and yeah. the rocks turned into the, the devil's arrows. Well, I've got some comments on that, and I've also got some comments on uh, St. Michael and the devil. Uh, there's the idea that it might be something to do with an alignment to the moon. Um, and we've seen that Aldebaran is uh, Canabai and Henge. Now, it has an interesting alignment to the Devil's Arrows, does Aldebaran, uh, and I'll cover that next time. I've then got, uh, and this I stumbled on by a total accident, uh, what I call the Ripon Cathedral hypothesis. So this is Ripon Cathedral. It's a good picture because you can see the sun just behind it. Now, the main line of uh, down here, well, not the main line down here, but the line that connects this to uh, that line between uh, the Devil's Arrows and Thornborough 
uh, is on the summer solstice line mm. and we'll cover that next time but I believe there's reason to think that Ripon Cathedral is built on a much older site, a much, much older site. Wow, that's cool. And uh, we'll cover that. <clears throat> I then want to talk about, is um, is there anything special about the location? I think there is. Um, I think there's certainly evidence that they knew what the circumference of the Earth is. Um, and then... We go into wider Yorkshire and a quick look at Rudstone. And if you remember the episode on fairies, and there was the one where uh, there were drunken fairies in a, um, a tumulus, and someone passing uh, was invited to have a drink, and he had a drink, and then ran off with the um, uh, the um, the cup. Yeah, you remember that? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that happened near Rudstone. Ah. So we'll mention that, that and a few right other lines. myths to go. Um, now, after that, I want to, in, if we, if you, if you want to continue doing episodes, yes, episode three, um, I look at alignments. So we briefly mention alignments. Um. I went through a period of collecting devil sites, so named after the devil or Satan or so on and so forth. Um, is, and if you're looking for lines, I think you need something more than just, you know, this, this post office lines up with that pub type thing. There needs to be some sort of similarity between them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll, we look at um, devil sites. Uh, and see whether there's any line up. Um, we get to Cornwall, Orkney, and France. Um, yeah, I don't want to say any more about that. All right. that's fine. <laughs> yeah. We'll get <laughs> to it that later. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> sounds good. I'm really looking um, forward to this. Yeah. And then there's a fourth one where uh, it, there's quite a lot about. Um, solar and lunar alignments um, it might be a bit repetitive but i think it does tell you a bit about the people and the type of things they were doing and what they were into uh, i i think that the thornborough henges were an observatory uh, and i think it was an observatory dedicated to the moon and i'll talk about why uh, i also talk about um some numbers that are encoded into the design. So there's the golden ratio there. I think there's pi. I think there's Yuli's number, which is E. Uh, I, there might also be the uh, the diameter of the moon. Oh, wow. Yeah. So talk about that. And then the final bit is the age of the sign and why I think it's a specific date. Okay. Excellent. Sounds fantastic. Stay tuned for that, folks. All right. All right. Well, I have some producers. What okay. do you think? You got some? You got a couple? Mm, let's see what's going on here. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes. Show. Yes. Very let me nice. let me let's get these producers in and then we'll we'll finish it out and uh thank Martin for sure. Um so uh Patreon producers for this episode. Um Executive producers, oh, let me make sure this is working right. Uh, it's not. There we go. Uh, Robert Dressel, uh, Philip Baklamov, Matt Shy, Peter Shell, Zachariah, and Zachariah Baker are all executive Patreon producers for this episode. And then associate executive producers, we have Hagen Tommen. Uh, Jim Niggles, Captain River Rat, Chris James, uh, Daniel Gandy, Dave Cortez, and Patrick Hicks, the patron saint. All right. Thank you all so Thank much. Thank you guys for supporting the show. We really appreciate it. We do have an uh, associate executive producer, and there's a note. There's a note. So I can't read the whole note He's on He's got to log in. Got to log in. <laughs> Sorry. Forgive me for this. Um, let's see if I can 
Yeah, you can pull it up. Can't see the whole note on my phone. That's really annoying, <laughs> PayPal. Annoying. I don't like you for that. Uh, but I have to stop the screen share. Here we go. And yeah, we haven't done. We've been a little uh, shy on the shows here, so let's see. Uh, how do I get to it? There it is. Ah, so this is from <clears throat> uh, M N Moto in the Discord. He says, hi, Snakes. Thank you for the most excellent mind-expanding podcast. In the last year or two, I've been on a journey of enlightenment, and your work has been a big part of that. I just sent you an email, Hey, by the way. Okay. He says. All right. Sumner, thank you so much. Thank you. Exec uh, associate executive producer of this show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. That's it. That's, that's what we got? Okay. Good deal. Hey, Martin, man, thank you so much. This it's has been, been a pleasure. A, yeah, it's been fantastic. Yeah, thank, thanks, thanks for having me. I mean, I just want to get these ideas out there. So. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, we'll have you on. Uh, we'll have you on for the next couple of weeks. Maybe we can do some Patreon episodes. Well, we can't do one yeah. today, but maybe we can do some Patreon episodes as well and talk about some further, deeper thoughts. I want to hear more about dowsing. So, <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you much more about it because I gave up. Actually, I can discuss map, map dowsing as well. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's yeah, cool. fantastic. All right, well, let's wrap it up. Once again, thanks, Martin, so much. Thanks to all of you who support the show. Yes. Uh, we love you guys. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Good night. <laughs> Get back to work.